five minutes in, so Andrew, we should probably get started with a little bit of conversation about about uh, ESG and, and social responsibility and that sort of thing. I've got a disclosure I'm supposed to read. Uh, Securities offered through LPL Financial, member FINRA, SIPC, Andrew Oleg, Calvert Research and Management, and Eden Vance Management are not affiliated with LPL Financial and Enduring Wealth Advisors. Okay, so now that we got that out of the way, I'm legal. And we are recording, by the way. And well, first, thank you, Dory, for, for, for making Andrew available to us. Uh, when we started doing these open open hours, we realized we wanted to get some people that we could talk with. And, and Dory was one of the very first people to say, hey, yeah, let's let's try and do something. Um, and uh, the area of ESG is is obviously an area of expertise that, that Eaton Vance saw value in and went out and, and acquired Calvert Research, which has been doing it for 30 years now, 20 or 30 years. We do, like yeah. That for a very long time, uh, probably um, probably the leading, um, at least in the mutual fund space, uh, the leading experts in social responsibility, but more importantly, e- with this, this notion of ESG. You wanna describe what ESG really means and how that plays out, Andrew? Yeah, and thanks for, for having us and for everybody joining us. Uh, um, so the idea of ESG is really looking at non-traditional factors when you build your mosaic of research on a company on whether you would invest in them or not on behalf of a client. And so in addition to looking at any financial research, you know, looking at the the company, the the leadership of the company, thinking about their competitive positioning, you look at things that used to be outside of the balance sheet, things that take into consideration environmental footprint. So greenhouse gas emissions, CO2 emissions, water use, how much waste a company creates. So that's that E piece. And it's, it's fairly easier to kind of price in E today. You know, we kind of understand that. The S piece is kind of a bigger bucket and a, and a much, I think, broadening bucket when you think about social issues, issues like supply chain. Where do you get the ingredients that you put in products that you sell to me as a company? How do you market those products? How do you treat your human capital, i.e. the the folks that you employ? How does your relationship look with your customers? So that's that social bucket. You think about things like product safety and then governance. That's that G piece, corporate governance, how a company is structured, how transparent a company is with investors because investors want to know a lot of this information. What does the board look like? Do you have diverse programs to attract, you know, a diverse work set, a talented work set? And so that's kind of the E, the S, and the G pillar. And it used to sit kind of outside of traditional financial management. But in today's world, we're really seeing a rapid acceleration of companies really trying to price in how these ESG issues affect how a company trades on the stock market. So you're you're saying that that we're seeing them get priced in. There's companies that are pricing this information in. Now you're talking about uh, investment advisory firms, but but isn't there isn't there some evidence that that companies that that behave in these manners actually perform well? So what we found, and this is just kind of a macro uh, level, but what we found is that companies that have elevated ESG programs and practices, or companies that have an elevated ESG score or level tend to have better return on invested capital, better market performance, better accounting performance in equities. On the bond side of things, companies that have a more elevated ESG level tend to have a lower cost of capital, i.e. the the rate at which they borrow seems to be lower and they default less. And then the cooler thing about it is when you look at periods like today or 2002, 2008, really challenging markets for an investor, Companies that have a better ESG level tend to have more of a cushion in these very volatile markets. And so there's, there's real evidence that you can actually use these lenses to, to better allocate and better construct a portfolio. Cool, cool. So um, we had talked before about you know the evolution of of ESG and and where it what it grew out of. And you want to address a little bit of that? I mean, the history of of investing 
for what used to be called socially responsibility? So it's interesting. It's really evolved historically. So in the, I mean, in, in some form of responsible investing has been around since the 16, 1700s with, with the monks and how they wanted to invest in certain ways. But in modern day, you know, in modern Wall Street, really ESG invested, investing started in the late 70s and early 80s. Uh, as companies started to say, there's certain behaviors or certain types of companies that we don't want to profit off of. Matter of fact, our, our roots at Calvert, we had a trade union that said, we don't want to profit off of human rights abuses. So Calvert, they, they called on us and said, figure out a way to, to make us money, but figure out a way to do it that doesn't support companies that are doing business with these apartheid in, in South Africa. So we were actually the first company to divest from, from human rights abuses it would be apartheid. And that kind of set off a, a kind of a seminal moment moving forward into, into modern day Wall Street where investors take a deeper look into not only what they own, but what the companies that they're owning are, are doing from a behavioral standpoint. And you can see it translate to where like, you know, I think a, a second iteration was early 2000s, where this idea of the way that the SEC has structured the ability to own companies as an investment house, you have these democratic levers that you can pull as an investor. So it really built out this, uh, this ability to, to signal management through proxy voting and, and, and the filing of shareholder resolutions. So that was kind of ESG 2.0. The idea of being a real active and engaged investor to push companies in the right direction. And then today where we have it, you know, if you think about 2020 and moving forward, it's the idea of really thinking through the, the complete and diverse set of factors that affect the company and applying those in a uniform manner across the global capital markets to really, to really have a, a great portfolio set you know, for a, for a group of clients, but also have better environmental and social outcomes in addition to potentially better portfolio outcomes. And so the idea of kind of divestment or exclusionary, company activism and being an active owner to really nudge Wall Street in the right direction and companies in the right direction, to today what I would call full integration of all of these ESG factors across the board. So it's really evolved to where it's at today. And we can do a lot better for investors, frankly, today than we could. We did, a, we did as good as we could have 42 years ago. But today you see much more consistent performance and much more predictable outcomes for investors just because of better data and better science around it. So one of the, uh, one of the things that uh, we were looking at or one of the funds that we looked at in our last review um, that we worked with with uh, Dory on, and I won't mention the fund, but uh, an Eaton Vance fund and a Calvert fund, the same exact management team, same or, or same exact fund, except there was one position difference between the two, which was kind of interesting to us uh, that there was there was only at a at a fund that had 75 or so positions, you have you have one difference, um, which brings me to an interest to to a question. Andrew, how would, for example, energy, let's just talk a sector, energy. I mean, there are all kinds, all kinds of debates about whether um, solar panels, for example, are truly uh, environmentally friendly because of the construction that goes into them and, and the damage they do to construct them, even though they, they re, they're renewable energy. Um, and then there's integrated oil companies, big oil companies that, that I mean, they act, they behave responsibly. How, how does the ESG equation work with those companies? A pretty broad question, but I would say, I guess from kind of a, a top-down view, if you think about, I think a broader term would be I, the idea of energy transition, right? The idea that we are globally transitioning kind of away from fossil fuels and onto renewable energy, regardless of, you know, what that, that arc looks like. If you're the biggest oil person advocate, they would say that peak oil is probably 2045, 2035 to 2045. Um, we're gonna see a peak in oil and then demand come down the other way. 
if you're the biggest renewable energy junkie in the world, they'd say probably 20, 25 to 2035. So pretty tight gap in where we see the ability for oil to peak and then the rest of the world from a policy perspective and from just a global build out of infrastructure, where the kind of the ball is moving towards, you know, to use a really over abused uh, sports analogy, I guess. To think about solar as a part of it, wind is a part of it, storage is a part of it, but more importantly, you know, just I'll name, you know, there was an article in February, the top 10 corporate buyers of green energy, Google, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft, BHP, QTS Realty, Walmart. Walmart, by the way, uses more energy than 17 U.S. states. They're a big consumer of energy, right? Uh, the Ball Corporation, Anheuser-Busch, and Starbucks. So it's not about these like tiny companies that are just kind of trying to operate out of a garage. What are the biggest companies on the planet doing with their capital expenditure? Where are they driving this $2 trillion marketplace? And how do we look at that through an ESG investor's lens? Does that make sense? And at Calvert's view, we, we would rather own companies with the ability to own companies that have, from a directionality perspective, the companies that are positioning themselves to take advantage of some of these long-term structural trends. And we would tend to avoid companies that have unmanageable risks associated with them that just might be structurally challenging for certain industries. So technology, technology companies are the obvious ones where, where ESG, it's really easy, I think, for, for that to get in. But I would suspect there's some technology companies out there that really good on environmental, but maybe not so much on social or, on, or even worse on the governance side. Got any issues, uh, any, any good examples or any bad examples there for us? I can give you two. Um, so think about, and so the way that we look at the world at Calvert is we really at the root of what we try to do, and we have a deep team of analysts that have expertise in these off balance sheet things that I talked about, environmental science, climate science, data science, human rights, supply chain science. So the, the ability to really kind of price these things in that, that used to be kind of tangential that now really have an impact into share price value. So think about the business, communication services, Microsoft, right? What is the big business that they're in, if you think about it? Well, they want to deploy systems to businesses across the world. So they're in the business of hiring. So they employ a huge employee base. So do they have programs and do they treat their workers in a fair way? And then I would say even probably more importantly to that, more immediate to that is data security. When you operate in that particular business, you better protect your, your clients, your customers, and your own data. And so when you think about things that are material to that kind of business, Microsoft's the company that absolutely excels on treating their employees right, having programs in-house, and out of all the businesses we look at in that kind of business, the, some of the best data security and cybersecurity programs to date. So that's a company that really takes care of the stuff that really matters to their business, right? So yeah, and the that. company's been, been at least modestly successful, I would say, too. Exactly, yeah. And so and what, what I was saying at Calvert, what we do is we try to identify, because ESG does not mean the same thing to all businesses universally. You got to be able to kind of navigate those waters. And so what we do at Calvert is try to understand what business is the company in? How do these ESG factors that are more prevalent today affect that kind of operator? And then more importantly, out of all the businesses in that, in that stack, how do they all stack up? How does management executing or navigating those waters so we can understand who's in a leadership position and who's really lagging behind or isn't even aware that they're lagging behind? So I'll um, give you I've, a converse, uh, kind of a converse counterpoint. That, that fund that you were talking about, the one name I believe the difference is Facebook, right? Is that where, you were, is that where we were going? Yep. <laughs> yep, yeah. We owned Facebook and as an owner of the, of the security, we had engaged them you know, on a host of things. Cybersecurity, have you figured out a business plan on what screen time does for kids and kind of that, the social impacts, there's real, societal impacts to this there's a lot of unknowns i guess you could say in the in the social media cloud it type kind of business more importantly though they had lax programs in-house they, they were kind of suspect 
I don't know if they were implicit or complicit, but they, on their platform, they potentially had the ability to have intervention from outside sources around an election. We saw that. So that would be a social, that's kind of a product safety issue, right? Just the fact that they were susceptible to this, right? Without kind of managing through it. And I don't think that any of us were aware of it at the time. More importantly though, when you think about structurally, how a company is comprised, all of the voting shares, no matter what Facebook does, we couldn't vote that board or that executive team out and try to turn the direction. Or even if we bought up all the shares, because Zuckerberg and his, his tight group, his control group, owns all the voting class. So directionally, we as investors really have no say. And so those were two reasons where we were trying to kind of move them forward to a point as far as we could. We just didn't get as far as we like to. So about a month and a half before that March period, I think it was March of 2018 when they had the single biggest dollar drop in the history of our market in one day. About a month and a half before, we, we pulled the reins and actually exited that position because we weren't getting a good, good sense from, from the engagement on that, what direction they were going. They've come back, I think, recovered to go on to set a new high. But uh, for a long time, that volatility actually was, we were validated by moving out of that security. But that we call a social and governance reason for, for moving away from them. It doesn't mean forever. That means just today. Can I say a comment here? Um, so I get clean, in, clean investing, and a lot of people are heading that way. But does it limit you? For example, Ralph mentioned there's only 75 holdings. So if one of those holdings fluctuate, you're going to see a bigger percentage change. How do you guys overcome the percentage of concentration in the portfolio? Hey, Peter, question. let me first clarify. The 75 holdings, we, I was using a, a, an example of, a, of, a, of two funds held through Eaton Vance. One is an Eaton Vance uh, labeled fund and the other one is a Calvert related fund and, and there's about 75 holdings. That's not the limit of Calvert and what they're doing. It's very little to do with that. It had to do with a specific example that I was, that I was given there. But I'm going to let Andrew explain it in more detail. Okay, thank you. Yeah, great question. And just to kind of take a step back, we, we cover the global capital marketplace. We actually have 20 different offerings or different flavors of different funds ranging from real short, high quality, you know, tactical cash throughout fixed income, small company, mid company, large company, both US and non US, even into the emerging markets. So that was just one of our 28 strategies. At Calvert Broadly, we have a, a, a bespoke proprietary score on over 4,000 companies and about, I would say, probably the bottom 30% are ineligible, but broadly, about 70% of companies that we evaluate at least borderline meet our set of principles. And so we actually run a, a couple of index offerings where you could, could, you could benchmark it against the, uh, the Russell 1000. And in that fund, we own about 750 names inside of that index offering. And so our universe is much more broad than that. This particular active strategy that we're talking about takes that new universe, but then employs a bottom-up fundamental approach to try to find out of those Russell 100 or Russell 1000 companies who are the 50 to 70 companies that have demonstrated the most consistent earnings growth? Because that's what that particular team looks for. So different styles or philosophies within, within the one lineup. Anything you'd add on that, Dory? I think um, it's, a, it's a great question when looking at uh, more concentrated portfolios. You know, obviously, if you have an S&P 500 as your benchmark and you're looking at the relationship to the investment that you're trying to utilize versus that benchmark. You know, a 500 name benchmark is gonna have a lot more diversification and diversification be great. When we as active managers look at companies and we start to whittle down what are the best companies that we wanna own, that's where that high quality piece comes into play. So whether you're looking at the Eaton Vance Fund or the Calvert Fund in this example, we are looking at those companies that we think have a better balance sheet than the rest. We have a, a better um, cash flow that have some kind of barriers to entry when it comes to a competitive advantage. So there's a lot of different things that we look at that 
filter these companies and these names to the top, you try to actually reduce the overall risk of your portfolio. You know, some, it's all about risk and reward dynamic when you're looking at an investment. So some names can be extremely risky, which can pay off in a good way, but it can also give you a lot more volatility on the downside. When we look at very high quality names in this example, and that is, is trying to filter out the higher risk names to give us actually um, a reduced level of risk. And so one of the things that Ralph and I had talked about with these two funds is that it, historically speaking, with this fewer name environment, we've been able to give you about 70% less downside when markets become very volatile on the downside, uh, while maintaining a very similar um, investment return profile over time. I, I think there's two dynamics at play there. Um, I do get that question a lot when it pertains to socially responsible and ESG investment, is if you're limiting your universe, are you, are you disallowing some potential upside? And then secondly, if you're concentrating your portfolio you have more risk inherent because you have a larger percentage of your portfolio in one name. And um, what we have been able to show over, you know, five years, 10 years, even 20 year periods is that we're actually reducing your overall risk while maintaining as good or better returns because we're really just focusing on those highest quality companies. So hopefully that, that adds a little extra it does. Thank you. I actually have a question. I'm sure you guys did a lot of studies. Like I've been doing this for over a decade and I would say probably a single number of clients actually ask for cleaning and clean investing, like no tobacco or whatever. So I'm sure you guys did a lot of studies. Do clients actually care about clean investing or do a lot of clients be like, just get your returns. That's all I care about. I just want to see if you guys did any, any studies in that respect. I'll defer to Ralph. Um, you know, I see a, a full range of, of the spectrum historically. So here's, here's, here's my answer. Um, we're seeing kind of a convergence. At Calvert, we've always satisfied clients that have this mission-oriented or values-based approach to their portfolio. Make me money, but here's some things that I either do want to be allocating towards to fund or things that I want to step away from because I don't want to participate in. We've always had those clients but we're seeing an increased convergence of clients that are purely capitalistic, purely just savagely returns-based and returns-oriented clients come to us and say, wow, applying these fundamentals, applying these lenses to this portfolio, we can actually achieve better portfolio outcomes. And so it's really wild because if you think about like a millennial or a Gen X, a Gen Y investor, think about somebody at a, at a at a 401k, some of these investors won't participate in a 401k if there's not a sustainable option. We can have you know, that conversation with them based on our process. Think about my dad, a 74-year-old baby boomer who grew up recycling tinfoil, who he has four grandkids now. He'd love to change the world, but he's pretty pragmatic and the economics better darn well work for him. I can have the same conversation with him, showing him the set of set of criteria that we use. And so it's really cool because it's opened up a much broader part of the world for us today. It's just about where do we accentuate different parts of the process for those different clients. Thank you. I'll add to that that you know we we absolutely see investors in these types of portfolios from both sides of the equation. One from people who really want to incorporate um, their values in their investment. So we, we see that investor for sure. We also see the investor that is purely focused on performance returns and risk profile. And they're interested in the, in the product because it's providing that expectation as well. You can actually look at a traditional investment. So we can actually go through and we can show you different sets of metrics now. And one really cool development in the whole space, not just at Calvert and Eaton Vance, but in the entire space, is with better data sets and more information, we can actually do a better job to illustrate it for a client. We can actually show you a responsible investment that could potentially, in, in some cases in our, in our lineup, has outperformed the traditional benchmark, 
But then more importantly, we can line those up and say, in addition to giving you, you know, full market participation or even better, we also have the potential for lowering environmental footprint, you know, carbon emissions, water use, toxic emissions, investing this way than had we invested traditionally. And so you kind of get a double benefit and we, we can actually show that to people now where even three years ago, we couldn't even illustrate that for clients. We, we knew it was there, but we couldn't, we didn't have the data to prove it. Now we do. You would, you'd use the example of Facebook where they were kind of drifting away from, or you just had no ability to, to have influence on the company. Do you run into those situations often? in public markets? I mean, I, I know of, I mean, it started with, with Henry Ford and the Ford family and, 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 and their super voting shares or however that works. It's a little different than uh, the super shares of the technology companies. But, but is that not the case with uh, a lot of companies now? You see it more and more. Like Uber went public a year ago, and it's estimated that they stumbled out of the gate because they had that, that structural setup as well, too because it's harder for analysts to price in. How do we exert uh, some controls or influence a company? By and large, the, the, the norm is to have the ability to vote proxies and signal management. Um, but you see certain companies, especially in the tech space that are structured that way still. Um, it's definitely evolved though. And I think the other thing that you probably didn't ask, but the ability to have more and more of an informed dialogue with companies, you know, to, to go at them and say, we are an owner of your security. Here are some things that you might not be thinking about from an environmental or social reason. You know, to go to, I'll give you a great example. A lot of the tech companies just south of where I live have all signed on to this thing called the RE100. There's over 700 companies now that have said that either now or at a certain date, very, cert very soon in, in the future, they will procure 100% of their energy in a renewable fashion. So they're changing the way that we consume energy. Um, so you can have that influence with companies and move them forward more today than, than I think you ever could. You're starting to see it again, if you think about what's happening in the healthcare crisis with the pandemic, clearly with the social justice issues that are going on around the, co the country, Again, you're looking to corporations to provide leadership. Um, and I think some of them have stepped up and are providing leadership in, in their communities. And so that's, I think, what investors are kind of looking to. What role can these corporations play in society moving forward? And how do we juxtapose that investment piece in them? So you, you brought up healthcare, and, and I'm sure that, that there are companies that are wonderful examples uh, of, of stewards of the public interest, if you will, uh, in the healthcare arena. But uh, there's also a lot of debate as to, I mean, our healthcare system has certainly had its share of debates over the past uh, couple of decades. Um, is, there, is there kind of a, a, a fence on one side or the other as, as to how, um, how Calvert would select a company that, that falls into that, that sector? Yeah, I mean, policy is one thing. So there's not a whole lot we can do there. We can engage and we can try to inform on Capitol Hill. We're based in Washington, D.C. But that's that one thing that policy we kind of rattle about and people get very polarized about, kind of red and blue. We don't really want to get into that battle. We, we get into the battle that how can companies be part of either the solution or if I'm an investor in these companies, am I at risk because they're part of the problem? I'll give you a great example. When you think about Pharmaceutical companies, so we, we support health, we need health care, we need health you know, to, to function as a society, as a capitalism driven economy. But there's certain risks out there uh, that, that we just think are way too large for our investors. And so one example would be a company that has historically had product safety issues around talcum powder and birth defects. And then most recently, even though they've spun these businesses off, still have significant ties to, and could, it could significantly affect their share price to the manufacture and distribution of pharmaceutical opioids, which if you haven't been paying attention over the last couple of years, is really a US-based pandemic. It's, it's affected all of our communities kind of indiscriminately, rich, poor, educated, not educated, but it's really a US problem. And so we've gone after some of those companies to say, you've, 
you know, you, you've created incentive systems and you've created lax governance to make a bunch of people wealthy, but at the sacrifice of, of our local communities and we're trying to put them back on the hook for cleaning it up. And just in the last year, some of those civil cases actually went to criminal cases and 14 state attorney generals have lined up against a couple of these pharmaceutical companies. And it's had a real negative of impact on those share prices. So we're happy that we, we don't own shares in those companies because as an investor, that's not a very good outlook. That makes sense? <laughs> yeah, major, major uh, class action lawsuits are never good for never good if you're on the wrong side of that uh, equation. And, and it's usually the corporations, especially those with the deep pockets that uh, uh, that wind up on the wrong side of those those equations. But there's got to be some companies in the healthcare sector that uh, that would be good examples of, of stewards. I mean, they're they're ostensibly trying to do good. Uh, yeah, it's Did easier for us to talk about the ones we don't own just because it doesn't look like we're promoting certain names. <laughs> but uh, oh, oh, gotcha. Yeah. Okay, no worries. You know, many of these many of these companies are doing the the right thing, and they're thinking through product safety and and thinking through pricing. You know, think about another issue is that when you think about uh, kind of collusion at the pricing level to defraud clients and customers, you. you you see that pretty prevalent in a lot of healthcare. So trying to kind of invest in the companies that have bucked the trend there, I think, and, and we, we would much more be willing to allocate to those kinds of companies than, one, than the ones that have kind of patterns of, of those programs in place. That makes sense? Absolutely, absolutely. While we're talking about healthcare pharmaceuticals, I, I, I'll put a plug in for one of my most recent book reviews. There's a book out called Bottle of Lies, The Inside Story of the Generic Drug Boom. And uh, we, we review books periodically. And I gave, that's my most recent gold medal review. And I was recommended the book by uh, a client or a prospective client at the time uh, that uh, worked in that industry. He did the examinations of these drug companies and how they produce their drugs. And and um, uh, he recommended, he says, it's actually worse than what the book describes. So if you're getting your drugs and they're manufactured in, in India, like most pharma, most uh, generics, uh, there's a good chance that they're not, uh, they're not quite what you think they are. Um, but uh, that's a different subject and it's not for you, but uh, not for- Yeah, uh, just, I will, just, I can mention there's a couple names that we really like from an ESV perspective, like Thermo Fisher, I believe is one that does bio and testing, testing, you know, certain tests are, are big right now. There's another name that we own that um, it's in a small cap space that actually has 10 years worth of contracts to make certain um, uh, pharmaceuticals for the, for the government, you know, and so, you know, there's very good line of sight and, and public health record to try to promote healthcare on behalf of our, our country. And so those are a couple of names that, that you know, we think are leading, are leading edge, you know. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'll give you another example because I, I, I read a report today from our analysts around utilities. Um, so we, uh, I live in Northern California. If you weren't uh, following along of the last couple of years, there's been a, a series of fires up here. Um, PG&E, where, where I buy my energy from, is actually just going through and trying to commence their bankruptcy filings and kind of re restructure by the end of June. But there's a 20 plus billion dollar price tag. And it's a company that really going back to 2010 didn't invest in their infrastructure. And so really put investors, putting investors at risk. And um, we dropped them from ownership you know, 10 plus years ago. Conversely, you might be down in the San Diego area and buy, buy your energy from Sempra. And that's a company that we've invested in, not only in our broad index, but in a clean water and clean energy fund, because they, about 80% of the water that they use is reclaimed or repurposed. So they're not pulling out of the watershed. 60% uh, of the energy that they distribute is, is renewable. And so really think about two businesses in the, in the energy delivery business, but two totally different investor outcomes. One of them kind of moving forward and, and creating potential returns. The other one restructuring. If you own those stocks or if you own those bonds, you might not even be made whole. And so again, from an ESG perspective, two totally different outcomes. 
Yeah, and I think it was announced today that uh, PG&E uh, pled guilty to manslaughter charges, and that's uh, that's almost unprecedented for uh, in, in recent times, anyway, um, for uh, the, the 82 lives that were lost up in Paradise when that village was uh, was overrun by the flames of the uh, the campfire. Yeah. I think it was. We, yeah, it's pretty. And it's uh, funny because yeah. they, you know, I read a two and a half page report today. The our analysts, you know, they said that they did a lot. And this this analyst, by the way, when I say we have deep expertise, spent years under the Department of Energy in Washington D.C. before we came over to to work for us. So he, he understands these issues very well and how to really price these into the most basic, like I was saying. But his point, his kind of biggest takeaway was they made progress, but they still fail our principles because. They just, you know, a lot of their energy was spent on on this bankruptcy to avoid potential litigation. Um, they're way behind on all of the targets they set, even though they've made progress. And they're going to waste even more energy because it's now named that their their new CEO is going to step down. So they're going to have a search coming. And so from a governance reason, they're just there's really not a whole lot of uh, line of sight there in our mind. You know, if you're a trader, maybe. If you're a long-term investor, it's probably more of a wait and see from an ESG perspective to see how some of this plays out. From a business perspective in general, it sounds like a company that uh, has been misrun, mismanaged for a long time, though. So um, I wanted to just make sure that every anybody else who has a question to rem remind you just to unmute your microphones and jump in. Um, we're we're uh, we're moving along, and uh, otherwise Andrew and Dory and I'll keep chit chatting here. So, absolutely. Um, the, and another area that um, that's kind of interesting, and and I don't know how it plays out from an ESG standpoint, is communications, in particular, um, the cell phones and the towers, and and the footprint that all of that kind of plays out with. Is there is there is are there some issues there? Well, I mean, so when I talk about the buyers of green energy, so there's this new advent over the last, call it seven years, called Green Bonds. We actually started a green bond fund, and it's a small part of the overall credit and fixed income marketplace, but very fast growing part of the credit space. Um, whereas today, and it used to be kind of countries that would issue a green bond to, to tr try to tighten up environmental policy or put water waste, sewer, water management, um, you know, energy efficiency programs in place. Today, some of the largest issuers of green bonds are, are corporations. Google did one a couple of years ago. Apple did the largest one at the time in late, late 2018, Verizon. And so going to your question, just did a green bond to put towers up to, to create a more efficient infrastructure. And so, and I think that Verizon deal came to market, uh, I think it was double subscribed to what they were looking to raise. There was that much appetite for, for a good credit, a good company um, to do good clean tech type of work. And so that just gives you an example, a small isolated example of the overall appetite for the continued growing I guess awareness of companies trying to make good on their their climate targets, their CO2 targets, their their clean tech targets. So what exactly is a green bond? And that's a so deal. That's a term I'm not familiar with. So a green bond is a bond that you, know, you can get the uh, a climate bonds, the CBI, Climate Bonds Initiative stamp of approval that says that the proceeds of this project are designated green. And so it could be a water reclamation project. It could be a, there's even certain green bonds in municipalities. We participated in one up here in California to pull people off the street to build. There was an old uh, dilapidated part of Oakland where they wanted to build it out and then put units for people to get them off the street to combat homelessness, but also create a center for mental health. And what they did was they tapped into the, I guess in 2012 in, in the San Francisco, there was a millionaire's tax that anybody over a million dollars was paying into this fund. It just kind of sat there and they didn't know what to do with it. And so it really deployed that money to get it to work, to put people out of the street, but also kind of 
keep them off the street. And I think it came in at like, a, I think it was a 15 year plus deal with um, over three and a half percent tax free yield. I mean, so great, a great credit supported by, by, by the infrastructure. So it's those types of deals where it's like kind of longer term green corporate issuance, isolated community type of issuance to really use those proceeds to build out uh, uh, the infrastructure, to build out kind of uh, this, this innovation, if you will. We did a, um, in, our, in our green bond fund, going back to a great example, kind of maybe to Peter's question on, on companies and concentration. In our index, we own Tesla. Tesla gets good E scores. They get extra credit for E because they're a disruptor around energy and they change the way we consume energy. They get kind of a, we kind of ratchet them down a little bit from an S perspective because they've had product recalls and they've had a couple of lawsuits, nothing major, big companies all, all have lawsuits. Um, they've had some governance issues with how they steward their capital and some key person issues with kind of even Elon Musk in the news. So overall, they kind of get a, a passing rating. So we own them in the index. Now what Dory was talking about is, is our, our, our active managers look for demonstrated earnings growth and, and, a, and a risk reward potential. Well, Tesla hasn't demonstrated consistent earnings growth. I don't think they've even had earnings. And at a thousand bucks a share, they look a little pricey. So in that particular product, they don't want to own them, right? Even though we have them in our index. But where we do own them is we own Tesla lease models with high FICO scores that are backed by the resale value of the Tesla. And so it's called an asset-backed security that we own in the green bond, short duration, even our, you know, our corporate credit fund. And so those are examples of where we will or won't own a company across the across. Sure. Can I actually say a comment That's about a green buildings? A lot of buildings now are becoming green buildings. Corporations are building buildings. Our own LPL, San Diego building, that's a green building. It was built a few years back. Um, what do you think of uh, so the sustainability of green buildings? Are you guys investing in that? Or what challenges do you find in that type of investing? Yeah, we are. Uh, and I think you're going to see that. Like, if you, if I brought up my green bond fund, you could see probably, gosh, from a sector perspective, uh, green renewable and er energy and energy efficiency is about 40% of the composite. Green buildings is about a quarter at 22 and change. Low carbon transport, so like electric vehicles and storage and things like that, kind of rounds out the top three. So it's probably one of our more important places that we invest. Absolutely. I think I'm stumped. <laughs> <laughs> I got all my questions answered uh, for sure. For I, sure. But we've been going. Go Greg, ahead, Debbie. This is Debbie. Hi. This just keeps going through my mind and I probably won't explain it the way I want to. But it's the idea of the the management in some of these companies now, uh, and no offense intended to anybody about, you know, the gray haired white male arrogance that now is, is part of these companies. And as time goes on, they won't be there anymore. And we'll have people, I think, that are more diversified and have different creativity and ideas and things like that as you know as the others die out kind of thing so i see a great future for for um this esg and stuff rather you know i think it's just going to get more and more important to individuals in in uh, well i would hope so anyway in our society Does yeah if you'll allow me um I, I totally agree and if you think about so we've always thought that diverse thought leads to a better operator, a better organization. You tend to perform better. Not only is that, it's just better for, for people, right? Um, I mentioned that ability as a company to engage, as an investor, to engage corporations that you own to kind of transform their operations. 
Over the last eight years, we've engaged over 100 companies on the S&P on diversity, to add diversity to their boardroom. And as of today, over 80 women and 15 minorities are on these boards. And so we've done that on behalf of our, our clientele. Um, more importantly, in 2019, last year, the last told out, the last S&P company finally added a woman to their board. And so now all of the S&P at least has one, one diverse person on their board. We don't think that's enough. Matter of fact, here's a, there's some studies out there today, like McKinsey, who puts out a lot of those consultant studies, says that at the crucial point is about 30% diversity. When you achieve diversity of thought at about 30% through your higher ranks, um, that elevates to better profitability, better performance. Um, we're actually part of a group called the 30% Coalition, which we won't even vote to re, uh, reassign a board member if there's not 30% diversity on that board. So we'll vote against the nominating member or any other members if they haven't achieved it. So that's how in real time we actually behave in according to, to our values and our principles. And there's much more awareness about that today than there ever has been. So I think, great point, Debbie, thank you. Oh, thank you. I, I, I'm, I'm reminded of a George Patton quote. Uh, I had to get it right, but if everyone's thinking alike, then somebody isn't thinking. Which goes to the to the diversity of thought and and uh, uh, that you're getting to, and and certainly he was a he was a leader, an ex excellent leader. Good deal, good deal. All right, well we're we're. We're we're pushed up to the hour that, that that we talked about taking. So, Andrew, I want to thank you for for this has been a, a really enjoyable conversation for me. I hope others have enjoyed it. Dory, thank you once again. Dory's been a great partner of ours for geez as long as she's been in the in the Southern California territory. Um, and uh, so so thank you for thank you for making this possible. Um, as always, uh, at Enduring Wealth Advisors, we try to help people accomplish their goals by by looking to the way to the to the uh, kinds of investment ideas that they have as well as what we're what we're capable of doing and we're able to deliver through LPL just about uh, just about anything out there um, so thank you all for joining us and we will be signing off shortly and uh, there'll be a recording I don't know that we're ever going to do anything with it but we did record so uh, <laughs> we'll see how that goes well, Thanks and again. I want to say thank you for for offering um, these, Ralph. It's been really interesting. Good, good. That's the idea. And we've got one next week. Um, uh, Mona, what's what's next? What's up next week? Um, That's the um, elder oh, uh, care. Yeah, the yes, care. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. The yeah, the the um, the the ignored conversation, yeah. and it, and it's a conversation about essentially about long term care. Yeah. and how to how to how to deal with long-term care the following week we have america's top uh marathoner from uh the last boston marathon and uh, scott fobble did a 209 in boston so uh it gives you an idea of the scope of uh, these conversations and what we're able to do and and uh we hope to continue to do them because because when we're talking about people's financial lives it, it touches not just the investments not just their like what we talked about tonight but there's so many ramifications of what it is we we have to draw in when we're when we're building a comprehensive financial plan for somebody so uh, so it's fun to have these conversations so thank you everybody